Uh, I'm Paul Frields, and I'm Senior Manager uh, for Linux Engineering at Red Hat. Um, and I also am a very long time Fedora contributor and a one time Fedora project leader. Um, and I still do some work on Fedora Magazine every once in a while as time allows. So what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about how to make a good image for uh, a Fedora Magazine article. We call these featured images. And if you're not sure what I'm talking about, let me uh, let me call up a new browser here and just give you an idea of what we're talking about. So I just searched for Fedora Magazine featured image. First link is to, for me at least, comes up with our official documentation. So I'm going to go visit that. And this is actually the Fedora Magazine official docs. There's a lot of docs here. But one of the things that we editors do is we create featured images. Um, and these featured images are the hopefully pretty pictures that you see that come up at the top of our articles on the magazine. We use those featured images for several things. One of the things that our, our publishing platform, which is WordPress, a fantastic free and open source software publishing platform. One of the things that, that gives us is it gives us uh, some uh, some fairly easy functions for having those images pop up for services like Twitter or Facebook or any of the other social sites where we might publish information about our in, uh, about our articles. Uh, so when we ask people to, hey, come visit the, uh, the magazine and read this article, they'll get a nice little lozenge that has that image in it. And so there are some guidelines around how we do images to so that people kind of know what they're getting when they click on it. It uh, gives them an extra hint and maybe it's some extra uh, some extra desire to uh, follow through and click on that link and come read the docs, right? Because we always love to, if we're going to write an article, we love for people to read it. We have a lot of contributors on the magazine and of course we want to promote them, the content that they've lovingly contributed to Fedora and having a nice image is a way to do that. Uh, today we're going to um, pick an article that we have upcoming uh, which happens to be an article on system D resolve D which is uh, going to enable some split DNS features in Fedora 33 uh, which at this time at the time of recording this that's in uh, beta and it's going to be out very soon, but you may be watching this in the future. And maybe Fedora 33 is old news by that point. That's fine, because uh, what we're going to cover here will, will still apply. So one of the things you can find is that we have an image repository out there, and uh, the instructions for cloning it are here. Um, so I'm going to go ahead. And, I actually have a clone of this already. Now, I will caution you, the first time you clone this, it is a pretty large repository. And by large, I mean, I think it is getting up towards two gigabytes now, um, maybe even a little bigger. It's it's pretty big. So leave yourself some time for this. If you need to get your first clone of it, maybe do it overnight or you know, go have a coffee or, or a bite to eat while you, while you grab it. Um, I actually have it already downloaded on my system because I use it all the time. All right, well, let me run through the first little bit here, which is um, how we get a, our template going. Now, there's an image template that's already in here, um, and it's stored in the images directory. There it is. Oh, I should have probably done the long listing. It is, it's just a couple megs, but it is a, it is a template. Now, these SVG files, these template files, um, we open them with a program called Inkscape, and that is also available in Fedora. If you don't have it, it's very easy to install. I think the instructions for that are also here in the documentation. Indeed, there they are. So if you have Git and Inkscape, that's all you need. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually launch Inkscape. Now, I could you know, go up here to my software and then look for Inkscape and launch it that way. That will work fine. I'll hit that and I will hit control O to open a picture. Um, I happen to have this, this images directory, which is in my, that's in the clone that I, that I already have on my system. I already have it there. Um, so I'm going to go down here. You'll notice I made a, I made a finished product here already, but we're going to work towards that. So you see how I got there. What I'm going to do is I'm going to look for the template file. There it is, template.svg, and I'm going to open that. And here it is. 
Here's our template. Now, one thing I'm not going to be able to do, I think, in this in this webinar is I can't teach everybody Inkscape, um, but there are a lot of tutorials on the web. There's a lot of YouTube videos and other things that you can go consult to find out um, how to use Inkscape. I will tell you that creating nice images in Inkscape, you don't need to do a lot to make a nice looking image um, with for some definition of nice, right? Um, we definitely have some great artists who've contributed beautiful images over time. Ryan Lurch has made a bunch of beautiful ones. I actually learned a lot by looking at his images and watching him make them and, and just picking up tips from him. But that is not to say that I know the things he knows. I do not. But I know enough to make something that's nice enough. And I can teach you that really easily. Okay. So here's our template. We've got it open here. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to use the minus key and shrink down my view so you can see the whole thing. I'm going to tour you around a couple things that you want to notice here. One of them is, uh, I'm going to plus so that we can cruise around here a little bit. One of them is that we've got a bunch of these little backgrounds here. Now, these are kind of, uh, I guess you call these kind of generic backgrounds. We try to use these as little as possible, right? Because otherwise it could be very boring if that's all we ever use for backgrounds. But if you really can't find anything that fits and you don't like anything you're finding, you can fall back on these. Um, so they exist. Uh, also, there's a little note here, and keep this in mind if you're making an image. This, you know, this tells you, oh, by the way, remember to remove, let me make this bigger, that little note here, we left it in the template, which I think is, is kind of cool. Um, and it says, let me get it where you can see it. Remo remember to remove all the unused backgrounds to the left, which cuts out several megabytes of unused data, right? And so, yeah, you do want to remove these before you start um, doing your work. So if you find, you've find you already found something, you want to use it, a photo you want to use, make sure you remove these before you save your, uh, your work um, into the repo so that our repo doesn't grow out of control uh, with too much data. That's just something to remember for later. Okay, but key being, we've got these backgrounds, but that's not what we're gonna do. We're gonna go, we're gonna go full on here. So I'm gonna select all, and I'm gonna hit the delete key, and that removed everything. Now, one thing I do recommend you do is as you you know make big changes in an, any Inkscape SVG, and even you know from time to time as you're working in it, clean up the document. Oh, and we need to save this as our new thing. I'm going to call this system D resolve D two. And I'm going to call it two because I already made an image like this. And again, I, I want to, uh, I want to show you from scratch. So I'm going to save this as a new document here. And once again, I'm going to clean it up. Notice how a little star appeared up here it means, oh, there must be something still to clean up. So I hit save again. And one more time, just clean it up, and we're good. So that that what that does is it just sort of pulls out unnecessary bits that are in the SVG, which is actually just XML behind the behind the covers uh, or under the covers. It kind of reorganizes it, cleans it up a bit, scrubs it, and makes it as small as possible. So that way, your your image can save a lot of size that way. Okay, great. So we've done that. We're ready to go. We have a blank template. Now you might be asking, what are these blue lines? This is something really important. These little blue lines give you a guide for where you want to keep your most important parts of your background. Because what will happen is different social sites and different ways that the web might use this image cut off the borders of the image sometimes. So if you, for example, if you use up the entire size of the image and run your text all the way from one side to the other, you might find on some places like maybe Facebook or Twitter, you're going to be you're going to be missing those letters. So you'll just get a chunk in the middle and you're going to miss the edges. So these are guides that help you understand, hey, I really want to keep my, my content, the important content in the middle here. You still want to fill up the whole image, but you don't want to put anything important in those gutters, if that makes sense. All right. So we've got this template. What do we do now? Let's find us, let's find a background. Now, Here's where things get here's where things get interesting. Um, you might be tempted to just go do a Yahoo or a Google or a Flickr search for images and you know just find something pretty and throw it in. But here's the thing: not all those images are licensed in a way that we can use them. And the last thing we want to do in Fedora is take somebody's copyrighted work and publish it on the magazine without permission. Um, 
Neither do we want to go out and have everybody have to ask people for permission. What would be much better is if we get our images only from sources where it is okay to use people's images without asking them permission, as long as we do something like credit them for the image, or an image that we are allowed to use in any way that we want without, without crediting anyone. However, we always like to give credit where we can. Now, I find a great place to get images is go to unsplash.com. They have absolutely beautiful pictures, um, high resolution, so we can use them. They have all sorts of subject matter there, um, which is fantastic when you're looking for something that's inspiring for your article. And everything that appears on Unsplash is freely usable. So the people who have uh, donated these, these this artwork or photography have put it under a license where you can use it for anything you want. And to be honest, you actually don't have to give them credit. That is not even required, but we always do in the magazine because we really appreciate the fact that they make that stuff available. Um, so here's the thing. How, how do I choose a background? What do I choose? Uh, should, should I use a mountain? Should I use a frog? I mean, what, what do I want? This, this is where I start thinking about what would be a neat way to represent what this article is about. And it may not be literal, right? One of the most literal things that happens, and I'm, I'm guilty of it myself. I do it all the time. I have an article about containers. So what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to go up here and search for containers. And what am I going to get? Lots of shipping containers. There they are. Shipping containers galore. I have used these kind of pictures many times for articles about containers and container technology. Boy, is that a tired trope but it happens every day. So um, just be aware that, you know, those cliches might come through. And maybe you want to think about something a little bit different. What about like Tupperware containers? I don't know if anybody knows what Tupperware is anymore. It was big when I was young, but apparently it's not big anymore. What about Rubbermaid? They make containers. Uh, they don't appear on here though. Uh, yeah. I wonder if food containers might appear in here somewhere. Okay, no, but there are some there are some other cool pictures here to give me some other ideas. And a nice way to do is go for landscape, which gives you a si or a, a um, an aspect ratio that is a lot like the aspect ratio of your image here, right? So that helps. Um, well, let's find something that's more like I don't know, result uh, system D resolve D. Here's the thing, resolve. Uh, you know, I, I did, I will admit, I did try this. And the thing that came up was very inspiring for like human resolve, determination. I mean, look at this person who's getting ready to go swimming, even though there's a shark. Okay, that's all fantastic, but doesn't really tell, I mean, it doesn't really give off the sense of our article, which is about name resolution. Uh, my, my inclination here is that name resolution is going to be pretty hard to find a picture that matches that. So uh, we may have to go for something more abstract. Um, here's, here's what I ended up doing after trying a few things like this, like names. I, you know, that didn't come up to anything that I really like. There's, you know, memorial walls and oh, honey and babe. I'm sure that will go over really well if we put that on the magazine cover. I can't see anything bad happening if we do that. Um, all sorts of good stuff here. But yeah, I had a really hard time finding anything. So what I decided to do was go for something abstract. Um, at first, I thought, well, system D and resolve system D resolve D and name resolution are net they are about networking, right? At their base, they're about networking. So I did actually look up network and just see what comes up. And you do get some kind of cool photos that come up. And look at this one. That one's kind of abstract, but it is very much like something we just used recently. This one's not bad. There's a few more, right? These are, you know, these can be very abstract. And the, the thing that you want to look for in photos like this is you're looking for something that is what we call low energy, not high energy. A high energy photo tends to have a lot of busyness in it, right? This is an example of this this exam this uh, photo right here is an example of something very high energy, meaning there's a lot of color changes in it. There's green, yellow, white. Um, a lot of things are in focus. It's very complex 
the photo is very complex when you look at it. It has a lot of shapes and a lot of things going on. And that's what we call high energy. And really what we're looking for some is something low energy because that means that we could put some text on top of it and nothing will distract from the text. Even this one here, it's a simpler picture, but this is still pretty high energy. Notice how all these circles, they're all in focus and they're very high contrast. And so it's going to be hard to put anything else on top of that and have it draw your eye because you're fighting against all of these other things that are going on. All right, so what might work better, this one's not bad, right? There's a lot of space in it. There's not a lot of energy going on. This one also, bright does not mean high energy, right? This is very bright, but you could put dark text on this and it would pop out really well. So that's not bad. You know, there are plenty others here. This is another good one. This also is not too bad. It's a little bit higher energy because again, you have these very, these, you know, uh, there's a lot of contrast happening, but it's not bad. Now, I'm going to show you what I did. Um, I decided these were all kind of, I don't know, they felt very generic and on the nose. And I thought, you know what? I'm actually going to go for something that's just very abstract um, and just some colors. I'm just going to see if I can find something that's colorful and pretty. And ultimately, actually, what I decided on is I really like this one right here. Not very high energy. Now, it, has, it, it is colorful and bright, but it's also not very high energy. There's not a lot of contrast in it. It moves very gradually between red and blue and purple. So you could put some bright text on this and it should pop out. So that, oh, okay, that'll work. I'll do that. So I just downloaded this. Uh, I, I'll download this picture. And notice this little box that pops up. This is one of the things I look for. If, if I'm not using Unsplash, if I'm using free image searches elsewhere, like uh, I think Flickr, lets you search for photos and you can search for just photos that are Creative Commons license. By the way, make sure that it, the only licenses that are okay for us for Creative Commons are Creative Commons Zero, which is basically public domain. It's close enough to public domain. Um, Creative Commons BY uh, or BY attribution, that's okay. And BY SA, which uh, is attribution share alike. Those are the only types of Creative Commons license that are okay. It's not okay for us to use non-commercial and it's not okay for us to use no derivatives because then we are we are uh, not passing along rights to other Fedora users. So those are the licenses that are okay. And the Unsplash site is fine because there really is the, the Unsplash license lets you use things for any purpose whatsoever. Um, so you're fine. So knowing that, I also have a little attribution notice here and typically I'll copy this and I'll make sure to paste it into the article or into the um, featured image caption. So let's let's keep this open for a little while, just so you know, we'll, we'll keep let that stick around here because we're going to use it later. All right, back to my Inkscape. Now that I've got my uh, beautiful photo, um, what am I going to do? Am I going to just stick that image in here? And the answer is no, before we pop that image in here, because that image is pretty large. Let me find my terminal. This is the actual downloaded form of the image. It is four megabytes in size, and that is too big. We do not need anything that big. So here's what I tend to do. I will run GIMP, and I'm gonna run this on the one I newly downloaded. Okay, here's that image. Notice the size of it. It is all. It is almost 5,500 by over 3,600. Now we don't need anything that big. The actual size that we need for a featured image in uh, uh, in the magazine is exactly 1,890 by 800. All of our images are that size. What I've done actually over on my system is in my crop tool in, um, in GIMP, I have set my crop tool because this is mostly what I use GIMP for nowadays is I've set a fixed aspect ratio for my crop tool to 1890 by 800. All right, and that's gonna come in handy. I'm gonna go ahead and crop this thing. And notice how when I created my crop, notice how it, it stays at this aspect ratio no matter how much I wanna clip out. That's kind of cool. All right, I'm just gonna make this as wide as the image because that's what I, I, I want to get as much of the image as possible. And I'm going to pick what I think is about the right area that it's not, 
you know, this, this doesn't have enough of the red in it. And this has too much of the red in it. So I'm going to find something in the middle that I like. Like about there. Okay. And now GIMP has highlighted what it's going to clip out. And then I'm going to click in the middle. Great. Now it's cropped. Now before I go anywhere, though, realize like this is still the original size. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to scale the image down to be 1890. So I typed in 1890 and I hit tab and the height automatically came in at the right number because it's uh, the, the proportions are linked. And then I'm going to just say, yeah, go ahead, scale it. Boom, there it goes, much smaller. Now I'm going to overwrite the original image. And I usually set the quality down too. It doesn't need to be very high. 75 is plenty um, because we're not aiming for we're not aiming for precision here. We're actually aiming for the image to be a little bit smoothed out, and that's fine. So we're going to export it, and then I'm done. Um, let me go back here and download it again. And that should have downloaded a probably one with a, a two at the end. Let me make sure. Yep, there it is. There's that big image. What I do, if I have Image Magic installed, which I think most Linux boxes do by default because a lot of things use that toolkit behind the scenes to do stuff. GIMP does, in fact. Um, you can do this. At a command line, you can do, um, I could do Mogrify, Scale 1890, which is going to bring the largest, that's going to bring the, since we're in a landscape, it's going to bring the largest dimension, that is the width, down to 1890 and take a quality of 75. We could do that. Let me point it at the correct file. And it does it in place. There we go. Yeah, so at, at this point though, you know, you would still need to crop this down 800. Now, I think there are ways to do that in Mogrify too. Like you could tell it, I want you to crop this to 800 height and start at a certain position, but you'd have to kind of just do it by feel and hope it came out right, which is why I tend to use GIMP. So, and the good thing is, notice how, um, you know, with in any case, all the thing, all the um, all the JPEGs that I that I worked on. Notice how all of these are much smaller. Instead of being like four megs, they're all like 140, 150 megabytes or kilobytes, excuse me, which is perfectly acceptable for a JPEG. All right, so now that we've got that done, we have our background, right? That was the whole point of all that. So what we're going to do is we're going to import that background in. We're going to hit import, and we're going to go grab our, uh, this is the JPEG that we first made. This is the one that's a little odd-sized. Um, I can actually show both of these, but let's start with the, the first one. And we're going to import this. Now, what you want to do is the, the default selection should be okay. You want to use embed, never link. Why? Because embed actually puts the data for the JPEG into the SVG file. Now, in one sense, that means that we've got a lot of JPEGs that are sitting in our Git repo, and that does make it large. And many people forget to scale uh, in the way that I've shown, which is why our repo is so big. But if you do remember to scale, this is actually the best way to do it, because it means that if somebody else picks up the SVG, they're not going to be missing a file and not know where to get it from. Um, you can leave the dots per inch to come from the file. That way, Inkscape will do the right thing. And you can leave the rendering mode at auto. It should be fine. In fact, I don't know why I don't do this. I've never selected this. Don't ask again. I look at this every time. I never, I never need to do anything but okay. I should probably set that to don't ask again. But not today, pal. Not doing it. All right. Now, here's our, here's our image. Fantastic. Well, the problem is we want to get this image down into that little page size. One of the things that I do is I turn on enable snapping and I have a few snaps enabled. One of them is snap to bounding box corners. Now this page that you see here acts like a bounding box. And so what that means is I can move this thing around and notice how, oh, I also have other things set on. Like I have snapping to edges, I think is set on snap nodes. And I think I have, yeah, any bounding boxes snapped as well. So what that means is as I move this around, you're going to see it kind of flick over to these guides because I have that snapping on. That's actually a really useful tool because it means I don't have to get, I don't have to zoom in to figure out whether I'm at the exact corner. I just kind of move close to it. And then like a vacuum cleaner, it just sucks it into the corner. 
Now I need to resize it. Now I want to make sure that the aspect ratio stays the same. I don't want, if I just hit the this um uh uh this corner arrow and start moving around, oh no, it's all the wrong size and I'm goofed up my picture. It's terrible. So I'm going to hit control Z to undo that. What I want to do to keep the aspect ratio the same is hold down the control key and then resize that way. And notice what happens when I get close here to the mounting box. Boop. Now, yes, there were some craziness. There's some craziness that happens, but be persistent. And eventually there you go. Boom. Now you're snapped into the bounding box. Awesome. Now my picture takes up the exact space that I want. I'm going to hit again. I'm going to hit that, um, that four key and the four just zooms the page out to be the maximum possible size on our screen, uh, fits it to the, to the window. And now we're in a good place where we can actually like start doing things with it. Okay. So here we start thinking about what do we want to have in our text? And this is where uh, it's important to have like a good title for your magazine article and use what I tend to do is I tend to use the magazine art, uh, article title. And to do that, I also, as an editor, I tend to make sure that the title is something good, right? Like that it's not going to be too, not going to be too esoteric. If people can't tell from the title, what it is that it's a, what it is the article is about, and they've never heard of it before, then it's probably not a great title. So we tend to change titles to be things like, um, uh, you know, draw pictures with Inkscape. If you just said introduction to Inkscape, how would anybody know what that is if they don't know what it is already? So we'd say, learn how to draw with Inkscape or learn how to manage your network with Network Manager or you know, whatever the case might be. So I'm going to pop over here to the magazine and take a look at behind the scenes at the article that we're going to that we're going to use. And I want to check what the title of that article is. Do, 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 do. So I'm going to go to our posts and find this article. And there it is. Here's the article, System D Resolve D, Introduction to Split DNS. And that's not a terrible title. Um, whenever you start talking about system innards, it gets a little bit harder to do this, right? But this article is more of a primer about what split DNS is and how it works. It is explaining how system D resolve D works to provide those functions. So given that we're not actually asking the reader to do anything, we're not asking them to level up somehow or learn to do something. We're really just teaching them what this is. So I'm okay with this title, System D Resolve D, Introduction to Split DNS. So that's what I'm going to use. All right, next thing we need to figure out is we need to add some text here to our picture. And so I'm going to just use that title. So I'm going to open up my, my text and font features here. By the way, I'm going to hit four again, and that way it resizes that page over to the left here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to figure out what kind of font do I want here? Um, I've got a lot of fonts installed here. All these are, I think these are all open and available through the, like the Google font foundry and other font foundries. We have several that we use um, that are recommended. Let me go back over here to our, our featured image documentation. Um, you know, we've got information here about our, our template. And we also talk about fonts. Here are fonts that we recommend using. You're not technically restricted to these as long as the font is open. You may not use fonts that are copyrighted that you downloaded from some random where site or something like that. Use fonts that everybody can get to freely. And so typically to find those fonts, we want people to go to something like Google Font Foundry or somewhere else that offers truly openly licensed fonts. Um, and they're usually under a license like the SIL license. So these are the ones we recommend. Um, I actually think for this one, something kind of open. It is a the, the article is a little bit technical, but I also don't want to scare anybody off by having big like chunky letters. So I'm going to use something a little more open. Um, and for me, I think like this mon this Montserrat that came up here actually, I I kind of like this. Um, and then I want want to decide like, well, what kind of heaviness do I want there? Let's I guess let's start with like a normal heaviness maybe. And I'm going to set that as the default. And I'm going to come over here into my picture. I'm going to hit the T key, which turns on the text tool. 
and I'm just going to click in the picture, and I'm just going to type system D resolve D, and then hit escape. Okay, now I have an object here. It's just a text object. Uh, the first thing I notice, of course, right off the bat is this is in black, and it looks terrible on the top of this picture. It's too dark, and I really want it to pop out, so I changed the color to white. Notice how when I did that, there's an outline on the letters, and that may be good in some cases. I don't particularly like it, so I'm going to hit shift and then click this color to, um, that's the basically remove, so it removes the the stroke by holding down the shift key i'm i'm activating a color on the on the stroke as opposed to the fill so if i were to click you know if i were to click um red the the fill of the font will turn red and if i wanted a blue outline i would hold down shift and click blue and now there's a blue outline so that's how you can control the two things separately i want the font to be white but i'm going to hold shift down on this x and that will get rid of the stroke yay that's what I wanted. All right, cool. Now we've got this. Um, now we've got this nice font or this uh, nice little text object that we can use. Now I still need to include the rest of the text. Uh, and what was that introduction to split DNS, right? So I'm just clicking here. I'll just hit a T. Uh, let me move that down here and say introduction to split DNS. All right, again black. I don't like that. I hit the escape key a bunch of times and now I'm going to click on it so I can alter it again. Um, I, I don't mind this being white again and then take off the outline. And okay. Uh, let's, let's call this okay for now. There are some things I don't like about this, but let's just call it, let's say that these, these bits of text are okay. Um, here's where you have to start using a little bit of a design eye. Um, now there are some tools to help us with this. First off, we probably want this to be somewhat centered. Um, what I like to do is kind of get the f things close to where I think they might look nice. And once they're there, I can kind of get an idea. Hey, does that work artistically? Okay, that's not bad. I could live with that. And here's what I would do. I like to make sure that things are centered against each other, and that's very easy to do. I'll click one. I'm going to hold down the shift. I'm going to click the second one. And then I'm going to go here to the, uh, where's my um, uh, alignment tool? It's somewhere around here. I can never find it. I always hit Control Shift A. That's how I do this. And that gives me the align and distribute. And so what I'm going to do is, okay, turn off grouping. So it's going to treat these as two different things. And what I'm going to say is relative to the last thing selected, center these. All right. What I've done now is now these two things are centered against each other. I'm going to group them. I'm going to hit Control G, and I'm going to all now they're in a group, and I'm going to say, okay, now relative to the page, put these in the center. Now they're centered against the page horizontally. We can also center them vertically. Hey, that doesn't look too bad. That's not too bad. Here's some problems though. If I look closely at this, what I see is over here, like around the R, the T, the D, the N, the S here, and and a couple other places here and there. The text is, it's a little harder to make out against the background, but you can't get any brighter than white. So, I mean, what am I going to do? I mean, I could make this a really terrible color, like, oh, I'll click on this and make this yellow. I'll, that didn't get any better. In fact, I think it's worse. I mean, it looks terrible. Um, it, it doesn't make any sense. These things are kind of shading towards white, and white is not a terrible color here. But what we need is some contrast. Here's an easy way to make things look spiffy. I use this all the time. Um, First, well, first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to hold the control key. I'm going to make this a little bit smaller because I think just overall this whole thing is just a little too big. There we go. But still, I've got the same problem. The INT over here in the DNS, they're kind of like a little harder to see. Or it's harder on the eyes. So I'm going to click on the object, and I'm going to add a filter to it, and it's going to uh, drop shadow. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a drop shadow. By default, the drop shadow is black. You can change the color, but um, I'm not going to. It's it's the exact right place for me. And I usually like to do a blur radius of somewhere between three and four. And I'm going to use no offset, meaning it's going to appear directly behind the object. It's not going to appear off to, a, to an angle or off to the side at all. And then I'm going to apply that. And notice what happens. 
there's like a little bit of shading around these letters now. And so now, even over here, where they were a little harder to see, now they pop out. That shadow really helps. Right? I'll take that outline out so you can really see how, how well that makes the image pop out now. And even if I scale it down, which I will do sometimes, the text still seems to pop out a little bit. Even at that small size, that, out, that shadow outline comes out. It really does. It really helps. Okay, neat. This is actually, like, this isn't very stylish. There's not much to it. I wasn't trying to get too fancy, but this is, this is a passable image. But let's say I wanted to do something even better. I've already got the, notice, I've already got this um, shadow applied, but that doesn't have to stop me from doing anything. Like, I might like to go to this text. I'm going to go to text and font, and I'm going to make this, instead of a light or a normal, I'm going to make this, like, semi-bold. We'll apply that. Ooh, look at that. And then I also know for a fact that this article, there may be a follow-up article. So what if we what if we made this so that it was like, here's something to think about. Like we might have a second or a third one of these. And maybe this is just one of several where we might be able to reuse the same background, the same image. So I had a colon here. Now, what did I do? I just, you know, I went in and edited this, but at the same time, did you notice what else happened? Like as I edited it, it's no longer centered. So I'm gonna, once again, go back here, go to align distribute and relative to the last object, which was the bottom piece, I'm gonna say recenter. And then I'm going to treat the whole thing as a group, or I could keep clicking out here until I can select the whole group and then just make sure that's centered. Oh, and that remains centered, so that's nice. Okay, so. That was just a way to tune it up a little bit. And notice how it draws the eye a little bit more to the system resolve, system D resolve D. That's actually kind of cool because right now this is a very hot, controversial topic in Fedora 33. So when people see that, they're probably going to be likely, ooh, I want to click on that and check it out. One other thing I might like to do, and there's no reason you can't get creative with this stuff too, right? Like I'm going to, I clicked in that group, now I'm going to click in it again so that I can alter the elements of the group. And I'm going to take this. Maybe I'd like, here's something I think might be cool. Is if I kind of move this off to the side like this. And maybe like, here's something I'm going to do. I'll hold down control and I'm going to, I'm holding down control again to make sure that I don't, you know, goof up the font and make it, you know, do something like that, right? So keep it in the same aspect ratio with that control key. And then I'm going to get to this one under it. And I'm going to see, man, what if I like made this smaller a little bit? That, ooh, look at that. So now I got a little bit, I didn't have to figure out the typeface or anything. I just like, you know, get it to the point where this thing is about the same width as this thing. And that looks pretty, pretty spiffy, I think, right? And if they're too close, I can move it down a little bit, right? But check it out. So that that's a pretty that's a pretty good little piece of text. Now, of course, I've moved it around again now. So I need to go back to my align, and against the page, I want to recenter it. Ta-da! There we go. That's not bad. And then, so we spent a long time talking about this, but you can tell that like, if you know, once you do this a few times, like you could whip whip something like this up in like five minutes flat, 10 minutes. Like I've done these during meetings sometimes where, you know, when the meeting goes past me, I'm like, okay, I don't have to worry about this, this part of me. Great. I can knock this out in like five minutes. Pow. Okay. Once that's done, again, we're going to clean up the document, clean it up, save it, clean it up again, just in case. Yep. We're good. No star. So we save it and quit. Pow. Okay, awesome. So now we have this beautiful graphic that we created. Now, when you're going to upload this to the magazine to use it as a featured image, this is pretty much the last step here, you have to turn it into a JPEG. Now, there are lots of ways to do that, but we've already provided this cool make file here. Now, if you're not into code and you don't know what any of this stuff means, do not worry about it. You do not have to worry about it. You can do this. You can just type make help and you'll find out what you need to do. 
In order to make an SVG or a PNG, you just need to type the file name. So I know the, what my file name is, right? It's that uh, systemd resolve d2.svg. So if I type make systemd resolve d2.jpg, all the things will be done for me. And at the end, I have a beautiful JPEG here. That JPEG is what you want to upload to the magazine as your featured image. OK, how do we do that? Well, let's hop over here to our post. And we're going to go down to featured image on the side. Now, all this presupposes that you have the right privileges to do this as, as an editor or as a, an image maker. If you don't, just consult the kind folks in the magazine help uh, channels, whether that's IRC or on our discourse board, and just chime up there and say, hey, I need help because I'm trying to do this and I don't have access. We can help you with that. What you do is set your featured image, upload your file. I'm going to go find my file. What do you think? Actually, here's what we'll do. I'm going to go to that images directory. Remember, I had another one of these that I did earlier. Oh, it's because I didn't make the JPEG for it. Let me, I'm going to do this because I made this one, I made one earlier um, this week. Let's look at both of them against each other. That's the one I did earlier. Which do you like better? This one or this one? This one or this one? A or B? I like B. Let's go for B. That's the one we just did. Let's keep it. It's beauty miss. Great. It's in there. Now, the last thing we can do um, for attribution is we can come over here. Remember, I kept this window open with our original in it. I'm going to copy this bit of text here, and I'm simply going to paste it into the caption and say set featured image. Once you do that, you have to save the article so that it gets the, the data. Then I hit preview, and ta-da! And notice how we get this nice, beautiful little attribution here and there's our image and this is what people will see when they visit the article now um when you're done don't forget that you want to you know commit your your changes here what is what's my my git thing that i've done here oh well i have a couple images and so what i'm actually going to do i'm going to cheat here and we're gonna we're gonna move the one i just did and i'm gonna copy that over i'm gonna replace the one i did earlier there we go. So now we should have just one of those, right? Oh, uh, yeah, and the JPEGs are still here. And that's fine. We have uh, we have things set up in the Git repo so that even if you've made JPEGs and there's a bunch of JPEGs cluttering it up, they'll never get committed in. So you don't have to worry about it. We've, we've taken care of that. And so now I'm going to just uh, check my status again. And it's just that one file. So I'm going to do a Git add. I'm going to commit it and say systemd resolve d intro to split dns and i happen to have i happen to have access so i can push this now um, if you don't have access though what you could do is you could push this to your own repo and then send us a pull request we do ask that if you make images please do send us a pull request with the source because that way you know we're doing the right thing like we're making the source available for everybody Type in my obscenely long key passphrase there, and boom. Now, our if I go to our uh, our repo, you will see in the commits. There it is. There's my commit. It's in there from a few seconds ago. There's our image, and so now it is there for all to make use of if they would like. Yeah. Oh, here's a couple things, some important guidelines. I, I think we added these in recently, which is when you're making these, like try not to use logos from Fedora or other projects. Um, well, we definitely don't want to use the Fedora logo with another logo because that usually takes very special permission from the, the logo owner, the other logo owner. And we don't like to use our own logo that much either, just because over, like, overusing it when we're talking about general topics like fedora didn't invent system d resolve d it was invented by the system d upstream so we don't want to pretend that we own it or that we had you know more to do with it than we did 
Um, we tend to keep the Fedora logo only for use in very specific cases, like if the project is trying to tell you something about the project. Um, and even then we, we only use it sparingly. So here are uh, some examples um, of our fonts. Um, you know, this is Montserrat here. Uh, this is Open Sans. Um, and this one here is Oswald. Um, these, these three um, are all, these are all kind of examples of just very matter of fact. They're simple. There's not a lot to them. Um, they don't have much of a mood, but they feel fairly welcoming. I would say, uh, you know, this, this Montserrat, I think feels very friendly and, uh, and maybe a little, a little sumptuous. Um, whereas the Open Sands and the Oswald are maybe a little more uh, down to earth, like they're a little more matter of fact. Um, Open Sands, in fact, I think Google used to use that for a lot of things until they came up with a new a new font family for their um, for their own uh, their own product use. Um, but you know, it still is a, a perfectly good font to use for just you know a very average run of the mill kind of headline. So if you're not sure what to use, those are all. These are all very good fonts to use when you don't know what else to do. Um, Bungie here uh, is an interesting font, and it's very highly stylized. This one I think comes off best when you're talking about something that's very um, that is very technical in nature, or something that should give off like that kind of high tech, you know, um, uh, next generation sort of feel. Uh, I like using um, these uh, the the slab, um, whether it's uh, Josephine slab or the Zilla slab. I think these are neat for when you are doing something that you're trying to show some people something that maybe is a little design oriented or something that is um, fun and friend fun but friendly. Um, Grand Hotel here, I think, is one of the. This is one of the like most cutesy fonts that we use and a lot of times we'll use that when we are trying to like have a like more of a human element in things like maybe a call to action like hey would you like to join the magazine like we might use something like that right um and what's our other one here oh that is roboto slab or Ro roboto slab so i would say if you're going to use you probably would use that in similar similar cases for these other slab fonts but you know these are these are not hard and fast rules, and there are other fonts out there. Like I know there's one called Molot that we've used before. Um, I don't know if you can see this here, but this Molot font, it's very like it's very um, heavy and very like this seems very non-humanist. Like it's more like if you're going to talk about technology uh, and go very deeply into it, that might be a good font for something like that. Now, these are all my opinions. I don't know if all, you know, if designers would share them. I'm going by what I kind of, how I interpret these fonts and how I've seen other like better and, and, and experienced designers use them. That's sort of the things that I've got out of them. We've got a few others too, like Iasevka. This is cute for if you want to like have something that's terminal like, it looks very much like a terminal font that could be useful. Um, one thing we don't use, we try and avoid interstate even though this is you know red hat used this font for a while before the red hot before the red hat fonts came along but we try and avoid this because we don't want to get confused with you know fedora is not the same as a red hat it is not a, a, a the same as a red hat product so we try and avoid that and also i i don't use the red hat for the same reason i don't use the red hat fonts themselves for the fedora magazine and i recommend other people stay away from them Oh, one other cool one. It's out there, silk screen. This is kind of cool. It's just a neat, it's just a neat little font. If you have to do something that's small but needs to be sort of techy, um, and maybe this is a small font that you use in addition to another font for a larger title. That's kind of cute. Well, I hope that this was helpful um, and not too long. Uh, I'm I'm Paul Frields, and I, again, I work a little bit with the Fedora Magazine from time to time. And Ben, say howdy and bye, I guess. Bye, everybody. Thanks for watching this tutorial. I'm Ben Cotton, the Fedora Program Manager and Fedora Magazine Editor. Yeah. Thank you all for, uh, for checking it out, and we hope to see you around the magazine helping. And until then, have a great one.
Isn't that beauteous? I think it's beauteous. Beautimus.